All right, well, let's um, dig into this letter that Paul wrote to the church of Rome, where you'll recall, uh, and really to the church of all time, so that he might explain to them the gospel that he was preaching, the gospel that God makes powerful to save, the gospel that he says that he was not ashamed of and neither should we. Now, remember that Paul began where every presentation of the gospel needs to begin, and that is with our need, with, with man's need. Why do we need a Savior? You see, if, if people don't understand that, they're not going to embrace Jesus Christ any more, again, than if we th threw them a lifesaver, a life preserver while they're on land and, and not drowning, they're not going to see their need of it. They're going to think you're crazy. And when you tell them about Jesus and His love for sinners and so forth, they're going to think you're crazy too unless they can actually understand why they would need such a Savior. So that's what Paul does. Now, he showed us in chapter 1 that the Gentiles are without excuse. They are culpable, even though they don't have God's Word, because they know He exists through what He has made. They know what He requires through their conscience. But they not only put God out of their minds, they practice and promote the things that He hates. Okay, so everybody outside the Jews is without excuse. And then in chapter 2, he turned his guns on the Jews to show them that they too are without excuse because they have God's Word, but they also don't keep it. Remember what Paul says in, cha in Romans chapter 2, verse 13. It is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. It's not enough to know what God says. It's not enough to even think what He says is good, to, to approve of it, even to teach it to other people. We actually need to do what He says if we are to be acceptable to Him. And by the way, that's frightening, isn't it? But it's meant to frighten us. The law is, well, that's why it was revealed in, in fire and in thunder and lightning and smoke and so forth on Mount Sinai. It's meant to evoke fear in our hearts. That's the reason why God gave the law in the first place. Not only the law in our hearts, you know, that the Gentiles have, but that also on stone or that which we have in the Bible. It was to show us that we couldn't keep it. That there is none righteous, not even one. Uh, remember, the law can only condemn. I remember, you know, in Pilgrim's Progress, we see Faithful climbing up the hill difficulty, and as he's climbing the hill, Moses comes running up swiftly behind him, and when he meets up with him, he takes a swing at Faithful, and he decks him to the ground. And Faithful is knocked out when he comes to. Moses is standing over him, and, and he says, please have mercy on me. And Moses says, I don't know how to show mercy, and he hits him again. And uh, he says that Moses would have finished him if it weren't for Jesus who comes up and tells Moses to leave him alone. Now, he didn't mean by that that Moses is some kind of a vicious guy, but Moses represents the law, and the law can only beat us to the ground. The law can only condemn us, but it does. God gave it to us to do that so that we would look outside of ourselves and our obedience and our righteousness in faith to the only one who can make us righteous and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this morning, Paul is going to continue to deal with the Jews. This time, he's going to show them that Abraham, okay, the father of the circumcised, the father of the faith, the one they most respected, was also justified by faith and not by works. And this was contrary to what the Jews believed. By the way, Paul seems to be addressing the Jews quite a bit in his letter to the Romans, it does appear as though a large constituency of this congregation was Jewish, and we, we don't want to forget that. It's Jews and Gentiles, as we've already seen. Now, he begins with this question in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? And what he means by this is how was Abraham justified? How was he accepted by God? Well, I already told you, the Jews believe that Abraham is accepted by his works, that God chose Abraham and entered into covenant with Abraham because of his obedience, because of his faithfulness. Now, if Paul can show them that he was justified by faith, 
that he really has nothing, even Abraham has nothing of which he can boast, that he can pull the rug out from under the Jewish belief in a works justification. So how was Abraham justified? Well, Paul quotes from Genesis 15, verse 6, a passage that he builds his whole case on. Okay, and so this is the refrain we need to keep seeing throughout this chapter. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, by this particular time in the book of Genesis, God had already promised Abraham that he was, you know, that all the nations would be blessed through him. Genesis 12, verse 3. He would be the one through whom he was going to send his Messiah into the world who would prove to be a blessing not just to the Jews, but to all the nations of the earth. And he had also given to him, uh, basically he had promised to him to give to him and to his descendants whom he would make as numerous as the dust of the earth, the land of Canaan, chapter 13, verses 15, excuse me, 14 and 15. So now in Genesis 15, verse 6, he again repeats his promise to give to Abraham as many children as the stars in the sky. And we read in that chapter and verse, Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, I don't think that we should assume that this was the first time that Abraham believed. That Abraham believed when God made those other promises as well. He believed God each time, but here Moses explicitly mentions Abraham's faith and God's response. Abraham believed and God counted him righteous. He made him righteous through faith as a free gift. Okay. So, this is the argument based upon this one passage, even as Paul in Romans chapter 1 would basically say the same thing, when, or what he already has said the same thing, that basically the gospel is how we are saved. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is not by works. Now, Paul wants to argue that this principle of receiving righteousness through faith alone is a free gift is the opposite of what the Jews believe. They believe it comes through works. Paul argues here that when you work, what you receive is what is due to you. you know, when your employer pays you, he's paying you for the work that you've done. He isn't doing you a favor. He's giving you what you have earned. But he's already pointed out that God did not give Abraham something he worked for. It's not Abraham obeyed. Abraham was faithful. Abraham was blameless in his way and God credited him as righteousness, it says Abraham believed. He believed in the one, notice, who justifies the ungodly. Now, that's very important um, addition. He justifies those who are unrighteous in themselves. God credited his faith as righteousness to Abraham. And again, remember what Martin Luther had to say about this in the face of Rome. Rome believes, and we've reviewed this many times, that we have to be personally righteous, personally just, perfectly sanctified before God will declare us to be just. In their view, for God to declare us just under any other ground or with, with any other grounds would be a religious fiction. It would be unjust of God to declare somebody to be just who in fact isn't just. And yet Paul here tells us that Abraham believed in the one who justifies not the righteous, but the one who justifies the ungodly. Now, we need to understand it's not that Abraham did not have righteousness. It's just that the righteousness that he had was not his, okay? He in and of himself was considered ungodly. The righteousness that justified him was an alien righteousness it was something outside of himself. It is the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness which God gives to those who actually put their trust in him. So he had righteousness. It just wasn't his righteousness. It was the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another error that we need to make sure we avoid here. We need to make sure we don't understand Paul saying here that Abraham's faith is what earned that justification. 
that his faith is what deserved that justification. That would be to turn faith into another work that one does in order to be justified. Now, historically, there, were, there was a group called the Neonomians, and that basically means the, those who believed in a new law, and they believed this. Uh, Richard Baxter, uh, maybe you're familiar with Richard Baxter, the famous Puritan. If you're not, you really ought to read his practical writings, but don't read his theological writings because he believed this doctrine. He was a Neonomian, and that's the reason why his theological writings tend not to be reprinted. They're very difficult to find because nobody wants to reprint them because they're full of error, because he believed this. Now, they believe that since the Ten Commandments were too difficult, nobody can keep them. Nobody is going to be good enough by that standard that God gave us a new law, neo-nomian, right? And that new law is the gospel. And when we obey that law by believing in Christ... God counts our faith, our obedience to that new command as our righteousness. In other words, you did a good thing, I'm going to reward that good thing, I'm going to justify you, I'm going to accept you based on that act of believing in Christ. Now, the funny thing is, sad thing really, this is how many evangelicals understand what Paul says here with regard to Abraham. I remember one of my professors in college saying exactly that, that Abraham believed, God saw his faith, and he said, I'm going to credit that faith to you as your evangelical righteousness. But we need to see that amounts to the same thing that Paul is condemning here. He's condemning justification by works. And if you reduce the gospel to one work that you do in order to be justified, you're still doing the same thing. That's the reason why he condemns the Judaizers for trying to get the Galatians to be circumcised. He says, if you even just do that one thing and you trust in that one thing besides Christ to save you, you've destroyed the principle of grace. You've added works to the gospel. We are not justified by our works, Paul says. We are justified by faith so that no one can boast. If we were justified by our obedience to the command to believe, then we could boast. You know, we did it, and you, you know, I did it, and you didn't do it, or whatever. You know, I, I'm the one who made the, the, the deciding you know, factor. I, I've, my obedience is what moved God to save me or made me acceptable to Him. No, there's none of that. Okay? No boasting in the gospel. Now, Paul strengthens this argument further by appealing to David who also received righteousness by faith. That's what we saw in our call to worship, remember. He writes in Psalm 32, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. On what basis? You know, David worked and he was good enough and God forgave him. No, that's not what Psalm 32 says. David says, I cried out to the Lord, I asked for His mercy and grace, I confessed my sins, and He forgave the guilt of my sins. Okay, He received this forgiveness, this justification, by looking to the Lord in faith, confessing His sins, He did not work for it. Okay, so Abraham was not justified by his works, but now what about his circumcision? Okay, is that something Abraham did? that justifies him in the sight of God. Now, the Jews not only misunderstood why God gave them the law. Remember, they thought God gave them the law so that they could keep the law and they could, um, you know, by, by keeping it well enough, God would declare them to be just. When he really gave it to them to show them they couldn't be good enough in order to drive them to Christ, they were also confused about circumcision in basically the same way. God had given it to them to point them to their need of a changed heart, of a circumcised heart, the new birth that only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, they looked at it as something they could do that would, be, that would guarantee them, virtually guarantee them eternal life. If I'm circumcised, I'm saved. Now, that's why the Jews believed they needed circumcision, and that's the reason why the Judaizers insisted that, 
that the Gentiles, believers, also be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. And that's why Paul, of course, addressed it the way he did. But Paul asks this question. Is the blessing of forgiveness, the righteousness we need to be accepted by God, is it for the circumcised only or for the, the uncircumcised also? Now, how does he answer the question? Well, he again refers to Genesis 15, verse 6. In verse 9, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. And his point here is in verse 10, before he was circumcised and not after. In other words, circumcision has nothing to do with Abraham's justification. Well, if, if circumcision isn't what justifies him, why did God give him circumcision in the first place? Well, Paul tells us he meant it to be a sign, a picture of the righteousness that he had while uncircumcised, the righteousness that he received by faith, the justification that comes through faith. He meant it to be a symbol of that change of heart that the Spirit of God gives in the new birth that enables one to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we, we talk about in the New Testament, we have baptism, which is a symbol of the washing of regeneration. A work of the Holy Spirit makes us alive and gives us the grace we need to trust in Jesus. Well, Old Testament circumcision was exactly the same thing, only it was a bloody sign pointing to the circumcision of the heart which is the same thing as the washing of regeneration. It's that new heart that comes through the new birth by the Holy Spirit. Abraham received circumcision to be a picture of this very thing. And he says that he also meant it, God meant it also to be a seal of that righteousness. And I realize that sometimes it's hard to get our minds around what it means that it's a seal. But what he means is the kind of seal that a king would use. You know, when he wants to prove that a document is coming from him. You know, the President of the United States, I think, has a seal that he puts on his documents. Kings of old, you know, would put uh, wax, a wax seal on a rolled up document and he'd put his signet ring in, the, in that wax and that would be his seal, meaning that document comes with his authority. So in this case, the same thing is true. This circumcision was meant to be a seal a seal of the righteousness, an official declaration by God that since the condition faith was met, the righteousness that brings justification has been given to Abraham. By the way, we know in the Old Covenant that that sign of circumcision was applied to all the male children. And do we believe from that that all these male children also believed and God gave it to them as a sign of the righteousness they had? and uh, sealing to them, uh, the, again, this, this justifying righteousness? Well, no, that's not how it functioned for them. What God meant it to do for them was to point them to their need of a circumcised heart, of their need of the new birth, of their need to look to God for His Spirit to actually make that change. Okay, sometimes, again, people today confuse baptism in the same way. They somehow think baptism can save you, give you that righteousness. Well, it can't any more than that circumcision could. It's essentially, again, getting back to circumcision, it was meant to point them to their need of a circumcised heart. And again, only God could give that. But the point that Paul's making here is this, that God declared him to be just before circumcision. Okay? Now, he did it not only to show the circumcision was not a part of the equation, that we're not saved through circumcision, but he also did it for another reason in verses 11 and 12, that he might be the spiritual father of both the uncircumcised and the circumcised. And I think what Paul means by that is that he might be the example that they could both look to of justification by faith alone. You know, we tend to look at the first person, although Abraham is not the first person, but he certainly is a premier example as a spiritual father. And certainly the Jews looked at him in that way. But they said, when you look to him, you should look at him as the father of the circumcised because of his faith, but also the father of the uncircumcised because he was declared just before he was circumcised. It was the faith and not the circumcision. 
Now, Paul makes another point by pointing to the land promise, and I think it's an auxiliary argument to simply again say, Abraham's not justified by his works. He's not justified even by the work of circumcision. And he, even, he, he and his descendants also received the land promise in the same way. And I think that's where he argues in verses 13 and following. God promised Abraham he was going to give him many descendants and that all the nations would be blessed through one descendant in particular, okay? But he also promised to give him the land of Canaan. Now, here Paul tells us that this land promise was really pointing beyond Canaan. It was pointing to the new world, to the new heavens and the new earth, that his spiritual descendants would actually inherit it. Now, why does Paul bring that up? Because he's asking the question, how are the descendants going to become the heirs of the world? Is it going to be through their obedience? Is it going to be through the law? Or is it going to be through the righteousness that comes through faith? Well, obviously, it's by faith. It can't be both. Paul is saying it can't be by works and by faith. For one thing, the two are mutually exclusive. Paul brings that up again and again. Um, it can't be earned and a gift at the same time. It's kind of like, you know, you work at your job, your employer pays you your wages, and you say, thank you for this, this gift you've given to me, and he'd probably look at you and think you're crazy. You, that's not a gift. It's not, you know, I didn't give it to you for no reason. You, you earned this. A gift and a wage are two different things. Paul keeps drawing our attention to them. They're mutually exclusive. But then he brings up another point in verse 15. It can't be by works because nobody can keep it. And this was the point behind Moses. Remember when Moses was beating the poor faithful? All the law can do is condemn us. That's why the inheritance of the, of the, 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 the world, the, the new heavens and the new earth, cannot come through works because our works can only condemn us. It can only come through faith. And he says, when it comes through faith, that means that there's no standard that you have to meet. There's no law to be kept, anything to measure up to before God can fulfill it. All you have to do is receive it. So there's nothing that prevents God from simply giving it to you because the standard that needed to be met was already met through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God made it so that the promise is received by faith, Paul says in verse 16 so that he might give it by his free grace alone, so that it might be guaranteed to everyone who believes, to both Jews and Gentiles. There's nothing they have to do to earn it. They just simply have to believe. And so if that's the case, God can make sure that it's given. And by the way, Paul also mentions that's the reason why God changed Abram. Remember, Abraham is not always Abraham. It was Abram to begin with. Why he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, which means the father of many nations, because he says that he would not just be, and again, sometimes we, we, we read that and we think, well, what, what God had in mind was, okay, Abraham had Isaac, but he also had Ishmael. So there's two nations. Um, and then after Sarah dies, he marries Ketera, and then he has many more children, and they become the basically the fathers of many more nations, and so Abraham did become the father of many nations physically, okay? But that's not really what Paul's referring to here. He's saying that he's become the father of all the nations because he is the spiritual example to both Jews and Gentiles of how God's promise could be received, and that is by faith alone, the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, Paul wants to make one last point before he closes this, and we need to see the connection that he, you know, the trail he begins to go down beginning, I believe, in verse 17 as well. What does Paul mean by faith? What kind of faith did Abraham have that God saw and credited to him as righteousness? Well, on Wednesday night, R.C. is going to explain to us the three elements to faith in, you know, in, in our study on saving faith. And, and you're familiar with them. They're basically these. First, there has to be the content, you know, what it is we are to believe, the gospel, 
or the account of what God has done to save sinners through Christ. We, we need that, otherwise we can't have saving faith. Secondly, there has to be the assent or the belief or conviction that this content, the gospel, what God has told us about what He has done through His Son is actually true. It really happened. And those who trust in Jesus Christ really will be saved. They really will be forgiven. We need to believe that. But there is also this final element of trust, okay? The looking to Jesus, the resting and relying on Him alone and what He has done alone to save us, to justify us, to make us acceptable to God. We understand from this that believing the facts is not enough. In the same way that Paul said to the Jews, you know, that you can have the law and you can agree with the law, but if you're not doing it, then you're no better than the Gentiles. Well, the same thing is true of the gospel. You can have the gospel. You can believe it's true. You can even think it's a great story. But if you're not actually trusting in the Jesus who is revealed to us in the gospel to save you and him alone, then you're not justified. Now, Paul here is focusing on that trust. You see, that's what sets Abraham's faith apart from any other type of belief. The trust that he placed in God. Now, he not only believed that God was able to do what he promised because he believes that God brings life from the dead. Remember when he was challenged by God or basically commanded by God to offer up Isaac? author to the Hebrews said that he believed that God was able to raise from the dead. He knew that God gives life to those who are dead. And remember, too, that he, God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac before he had gotten married and had any children. This would be the end of the promise. But Abraham knew that God had promised to give him a numerous seed through Isaac. And so he reasoned, even if I kill him, God will raise him up again because he will fulfill that promise. That's the kind of trust that Abraham had. He also knew that God calls into existence what doesn't exist. I think Abraham was familiar with the, the Genesis narrative. In the beginning, basically, there was nothing but God, but then God speaks and everything comes into being, you know, in the course of six days, right? God creates everything that is by his word. No lack of power on God's part. So Abraham believed that God could do what he promised, and he even went further than that. He actually believed he would do what he had promised. It's one thing to believe God is able, but it's another thing to believe God actually will do what he did. So when it looked as though there was no hope that he would have a son, remember God tests faith. He brings us to a place where it looks like there's no hope before he breaks in with all the light and and the glory of the fulfillment of his promises, Abraham, it looked to him like there was no hope, humanly speaking, because he was 100 years old. Sarah's condition as well. She was 90. She had never conceived a child. But in the middle of this hopeless situation, he found hope in God, in the promise God made to him that he would make him the father of many nations. He focused on God's integrity, and focusing on that, he grew strong in his faith and he was fully assured that God would do exactly what he said he would. And that is then what Paul says God credited to him as righteousness. Now again, not that act of believing, but because he had the faith that trusted in him, he gave to him that righteousness that comes from Christ. Remember, the cross goes both directions, not just into the future, but also into the past. Now, this is the kind of faith, Paul says, that glorifies God. This is the kind of faith that God gives in the new birth, the kind that takes him at his word, the kind that, you know, that, well, that believes that he is faithful and that he is true and that he will do everything he said he would do even when the circumstances seem to dictate otherwise. This is the kind of faith that justifies so Abraham believed, and by the way, he saw the fulfillment, didn't he? He saw the fulfillment of God's promise by faith, not just to give him one child, but to give him many, even in his lifetime. 
he by faith saw the fulfillment of the promise to give him and his descendants the land of Canaan, even though he didn't live to see it. The author to the Hebrews said he still saw it. He saw it by faith because his trust in God. God said he was going to do it. That land belongs to me. Well, Abraham says he saw not just Canaan, but he saw the worlds that God would give to his descendants. And he also saw the fulfillment of that particular child through whom all the nations would be blessed. Remember what Jesus said about Abraham? Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. You're not yet 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? I mean, he lived hundreds of years ago. Well, no, he's saying Abraham saw me by faith. He took hold of me by faith through the promises of God. You see, that is what justified Abraham was by trusting in Christ. He trusted that God would do all of these things. He believed it. It was, a, it was a done deal. And God declared him to be righteous, to be justified. Now, Paul says that Moses wrote this down, not just to memorialize Abraham, the faith that he had by God's grace, but he had him write it down so that we would also know today, we, everybody throughout church history, from that time on, that if we believe in him, that if we believe in, in God who gave Jesus for our sins and raised him for our justification, we also will receive the same righteousness by faith, the righteousness that justifies. This is only one way it comes, not through anything we can do, but only by trusting in God who gave us his son, which is, of course, what the table reminds us of this morning. So before we come to the table, we, we do need to ask ourselves the, I think, the applicational question. You know, do we have this kind of faith? Does our faith just extend to the facts? We believe it's true, but it really has no impact on our lives. Or do we have the kind of faith that, you know, has such implicit trust in the Lord that when He says something, we believe it, He gives us a promise, we accept it, he tells us, this is what I want you to do, and we do it, don't do this, and we don't do it. None of us do that perfectly, by the way. But do we have a heart that is going that direction? Do we find ourselves doing these things? Do we find ourselves, hopefully by His grace, growing in these things? If that's the case, then we have the faith that justifies. We've actually taken hold of Jesus Christ, and we are saved, we are just by His righteousness. And if that is the case, then the table is for us. So let's just take a moment and let's bow in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to use what we've seen, as much as we can remember of it, to test our own hearts, to see if we have the faith that justifies. If we do, then we need to come to the table to nurture that faith. If we don't, then we need to look to Christ, okay? We shouldn't come to the table if we don't have that faith because of the warning, 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, we need to go to Christ first. So, but if we've been to Christ, if we've trusted in Him, then the table is for us. Okay, let's take just a few moments.